was going through a difficult time in my life and I shared a story. Sat down and my first thought was, that sucked. They're gonna rip me apart on the evaluation. My evaluator, Chris, got up and he started giving me some feedback and it was very helpful. And before he walked off the stage, he said, I don't know what you did today, Mike, but that's the best speech I've ever heard you give. What did I do? I just got up there and I felt like all I was doing was complaining and moaning. And what I realized in retrospect, it was the first time I'd ever truly been willing to be vulnerable in front of an audience. I was dusting my office one day when I had a can of furniture polish and I'm dusting away because people had told me for years, you're such a polished speaker. Oh, you look so good up there. And I, I wore that as a badge of honor, right? Because the hair was good, the suit and all that. Well, I'm polishing my furniture and I look down at this can of furniture polish, which you can see, and it said, oh, nothing sticks to polish. Welcome to the Seven Hats Podcast. My name is Yuval Selig, and I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey, the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas, what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, Seven Hatters. In this episode, we speak with Michael Davis and dive deep into the captivating world of storytelling as we tap into hats three and four, the servant and the entrepreneur. Our special guest today is not your typical speaker or coach. This storytelling expert possesses a rare gift for weaving words into captivating tales that grip the hearts and minds of audiences worldwide. Get ready to be inspired as we explore the untapped potential within you and unveil the key ingredients that turn a simple story into a captivating masterpiece. But hold on tight because this episode is not for the faint of heart. We're about to peel back the layers of conventional storytelling and delve into the immersive world of senses and emotions. Discover how to transport your audience to vivid landscapes where they can see, hear, smell, and feel every moment of your story. Oh, and let's not forget the exhilarating virtual realm of TEDx. Michael will guide us through the thrilling opportunities and challenges that arise when delivering a TEDx talk, how to audition like a pro, captivate the selection committee, and ultimately grace the iconic red circle with your transformative message. So if you're ready to become the speaker everybody wants to hear, Let's welcome Michael to the Seven Hats. Michael, welcome to the Seven Hats. Thank you, Yuval. Great to be with you. Uh, I love just the title alone, Seven Hats, is intriguing. So It is intriguing. I used to, you know, before the Seven Hats, it was going to be called the Seven Summits. And I think that was taken someplace. So I was like, you know, I got to figure out a better... A better catchy title, Seven Hats, uh, my co-founder from Promomash, uh, brought brought to my attention. And the rest is history, as they say. So I'm really excited, Michael. You know, who Thank doesn't you. like a good story? No one. No right? one. It's true. It's in our DNA. Our species survived because of stories. You know, every every culture has its own tradition of storytelling. Even if the story is the same, right? It can be told in so many different ways. A great storyteller using vivid imagery can really change the way people think and act. And, you know, we know of some incredible storytellers who changed the world many yes. times over. We're looking at Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, um, JFK, Steve Jobs, Shakespeare, Walt Disney. I mean, so many others, so many, many amazing storytellers. And now I am speaking with... Michael Davis, not only a fantastic storyteller in his own right, but one who teaches others on how to be great storytellers. So before we learn the craft of the fable, Michael, mm -hmm. the Seven Hatters want to know the story of Michael Davis. So sure. take us back, I always say, way back. Take us back 
Michael II. Where were you born and how was your childhood like? I was born in an American army hospital in a town called Verdun, France. Wow. Now, a lot of people haven't heard of that. There was a, an incredibly horrific battle fought there in World War I. I mean, depending on what you read, hundreds of thousands of men killed. And the irony is there was not an ounce of ground gained on either side when it was over. But neither here nor there about me. Um, <laughs> I was born there to a, a French mother and a German father. German father was in the American Army. Don't know how that was possible in 1963. And uh, when I was a baby, mom had always wanted to move to the States. We came to the United States and moved to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Nice. Which at that time was a small city that was well known for a racetrack, which will come in mm -hmm. later in my story. Uh, but my father left when I was two. And mom remarried when I was three and to the man who is, he's always been my dad and grew up in, in India, uh, actually in a small town called Harrison, Ohio, which is on the Ohio, Indiana border. Dad was a teacher, took a job there and grew up there and had a wonderful childhood. I played sports year round, grew up in a trailer park. I always like to say, yeah, I'm, I'm trailer park kind of guy. <laughs> and uh, spent my first, my next 11 years between three and 14 in a, a trailer park with a bunch of guys. And it was just sports year round and always had a, a safe place to live. Parents who, who raised me and loved me. And uh, so it was a good childhood. I can't complain. And then when I was uh, 14, we moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, which was a big culture shift coming from what I would term wasp country, white Anglo-Saxon yeah. American Protestant to a city which had a, a lot of different cultures, which was great for me at a formative time in my life to meet people from different backgrounds. Yeah. That was my foundation. I went to a, a fabulous high school here in Cincinnati called Wanted Hills and then went to the University of Cincinnati. So that's what got me started into my young adulthood. Any uh, siblings? I have one half-brother who is 21 years younger than me. Uh, I, I know him, my father, who had left. He had a son, and that's a whole other story <laughs> about how he was uh, actually born in Korea. Wow. And then when, when, when our father uh, divorced from Chris's mom, they moved to the United States. My, my father moved here with my brother Chris because in Korea, if you're half Korean, half anything else, yeah. you're treated pretty poorly. Really? So they decided to bring him here. So uh, he, he was raised by his, our father. And uh, I eventually met Chris, which was pretty cool. Have you kept in touch? Have you connected with your biological dad since he left? Have not. When I talk to people who have either been given up for adoption or had a parent leave, they're astounded when I say to them, I never felt the need to, to meet him and talk to him because my dad, my dad is an awesome dad and I didn't need anybody else. And, and some people I tell that to them, like, I just can't conceive of you not wanting to meet him. Just never needed to until I had my son and I wanted to make sure there was no family history of medical issues. Um. I never did contact my father, but his sister was alive at the time. And she told me about my brother. That's how Chris and I eventually met. So just never wanted to, never felt the need to. Uh-huh. And how did they raise you? What did they expect of you? What was kind of the the character traits that they instilled in you growing up? Get good grades. That was not acceptable not to do well in school. Get the education. Uh, don't lie. And uh, they let me be a kid. I mean, I was expected to do homework every day, which I did. And sports was a big part. That was a connecting link for my dad and me. I was watching basketball, uh -huh. football, baseball growing up. Uh, he exposed me to the Indianapolis 500, which has become a like a passion for me in my life. Uh, but just knowing that I had two parents that were there that loved and, and cared for me and just that security was huge. Uh, although I have wondered over time, and we can never know this in our lives when, when our life is put on a certain path. There were insecurities that I had for a long time well into my adulthood that I can only trace back to being left by my father. Yeah. And when you're two years old and half your world walks out, it's got to have a, 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 a psychological impact on you to make you feel like you're not worthy. Of course. And it took me well into my adulthood to figure that out. So, you know, one day I woke up and said, you know, he missed out on something. 
It's his loss, not mine. And when you were in high school, college, what was the dream? What did you want to do? You know, Yuval, I didn't, I don't recall having this burning dream, which is why it took me a while into my late twenties to start to have some direction in life. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were a, a lot of activities I liked and all candor. I liked to party and have fun and chase the opposite sex. <laughs> you and me both, brother. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why, why do I need to get tied down into a, a permanent job? And I just did not follow the traditional career path. Now I can laugh about it. I wish I'd had more discipline back then, yeah. but I didn't. So you regret kind of, Spending that time not focusing on potentially career or some passion of yours, do you feel those are wasted? Not wasted, but unutilized you know, uh, years of your life that you could have done something different? Because I, I feel the same. Like for me, I didn't start becoming serious and as an entrepreneur until I was in my late 20s. And these days, I mean, you have entrepreneurs at 12 years old these days, right? So right. That's, that's the question that I've always you know, pondered. Do you regret some of those days? You know, I'm 59 now and I don't. And for a, for a time, maybe in my forties, I did. I thought, oh, I could have been in such a different place. But now that I look back, each of our lives is like this mosaic and yeah. all these little pieces make it and, and create this unique picture. I had some experiences. I had some entrepreneurial ideas when I was in my teens. I remember trying to create an online marketing business when I was 14 or 15. There just wasn't, when I say online, obviously online didn't exist. I meant uh, mail order marketing, yeah. which was now online. Um, but mail order marketing, I was always searching and I just was not the kind, I never had a corporate job. Well, I did. I worked for a bank for nine months. And the reason I worked for nine is because I wasn't going to work for 10. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't happening. I just could not. I cannot conceive of that mindset. So I've always done something entrepreneurial sales oriented, but no, I, I, I don't regret those because they all added to where I am today and they gave me experiences and lessons. And that's mm -hmm. the only way we learn and grow is make a lot of failures. Yeah, absolutely. So you didn't really have a path and you got out of college and well, what did you do after that? I started in sales. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I tried selling cookware at first, and that was a very short-lived project. And then I started. You could have doing, been the next Ron Popeil. I, I could mean, have been uh, chosen, or Martha Stewart. Who knows? Yeah, kind of look good in an apron though. <laughs> <laughs> I I got involved with telemarketing for a gentleman who was a friend of my dad's who was selling insurance. And he would just have me call people and set appointments. And that was my backdoor entry into the world of financial planning. Wow. Which was, I started when I was 25 years old. And I thought, oh, okay, this look, looks like a fun uh, job or career until I figure out what I want to do. And I stayed in that for 28 years. Wow. You never know. You take a certain job and you go in a direction you never anticipated. So 28 years go by. And then what happens? Well, when I was... 55 years old, 2018, I said, I need to either make a complete break from this and do what I really want to do or forget it and just stay in this career that I like, but it's not my driving passion. So in 2018, I made a complete break from the industry and I burned the ships. I mean, I... I didn't, I let all my licenses expire and everything. I did not want to have that safety net anymore. Now, the story of how I got to what I do today was not born in 2018. It was actually born on a desk in first grade in 1969. Wow. Yeah, it was uh, one Tell of those. Tell us the story, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it was one of those <laughs> afternoons where it was raining outside, it's indoor recess, and I'm bored. So I decide, you've all, I'm going to jump up on my desk and I'm going to have some fun. I'm going to dance and sing. And also, this was not long after Neil Armstrong had walked on the moon. So I thought, I want to be the next astronaut. So I'm practicing flying through space. I'm having a great time on this desk. Yeah. Until Mrs. North walks back in the room, takes one look at me and says, well, since you love standing on your desk so much, I'm going to let you do it during nap time so everyone can see you, Michael. Oh, man. Uh-oh. So here we are about an hour and a half later, lights are off, rain's hitting the window, still rainy outside, and I'm standing on this desk 
my friends are not sleeping. Everyone is looking up at me and they are silently taunting me. I mean, they're making the faces and they're pointing and, hey, hey, he looks stupid up there. I mean, just awful. And all I can think, even though this was a long time ago, I can remember thinking, please let me get down. Please let me get down. I promise I'll never be bad again. And when Mrs. North finally said, you can get down now, I hope you've learned your lesson. No, I had. I thought, I'm never standing in front of people again. Mm. And for the next 25 years, I did not stand in front of people again unless I was made to, either through school or work. Well, jump ahead to 1994. I've, I've been a financial planner for a few years, and part of my job is to give presentations specifically retirement planning workshops to prospective clients. I have to get people to come through the door. Well, one morning, my boss sits me down in his office and he slides this stack of papers across to me and says, you know what? On second thought, don't bother reading these. These are evaluations from your last workshop, Michael. Your speaking skills are lousy. <laughs> your stories suck. You are boring. He was a real touchy-feely kind of guy, <laughs> right between the eyes. So right then, now the desk incident from first grade, I had buried that in my subconscious. I'd forgotten yeah. all about it. But that was the moment I had to make a decision. Do I deal with the fear of speaking and being in front of people, or do I save my job? Yeah. I chose to, to deal with the fear. And I went to Toastmasters International. Yep. And that started me on the path to where I am with you today, because it was there that I learned, first of all, as you mentioned earlier, storytelling, speaking, it, it's ingrained in us. And the fear of speaking is natural. It was a survival tool with our ancestors. So the fear is natural. Second, everybody's had a bad experience in front of a group. And number three, it's a learnable skill. Yeah. Who knew? You know, back then I'd look at a great speaker and think, oh my gosh, that person was born that way. They weren't. They learned that skill. That set me on a path. Now, for the first eight years of that path, I didn't have a lot of success. I learned kind of how to manage my fear and get in front of people. That wasn't an issue. But my parents raised a do-it-yourselfer. Yeah. If you want it done right, do it yourself. And that really hindered me for eight years. So when you first began your career in speaking, do you remember the first time, first, first time that you were on stage in front of a decent crowd? What did you learn about yourself that day? I learned I wouldn't die from speaking. I learned that I could do it, but I had a lot of work to do to overcome this fear. And it took me a while to discover this, but I was incredibly insecure. And again, I think that all stems back to what happened when I was two, when I was half half abandoned. And I just think that's that's one of the messages that that was buried into me was you don't have a lot of value and what you have to say, who cares? You're not you don't have anything of value to say. So it took me a long time to figure that out. But the early lessons were you can do this, but it it's gonna take some work. So you're in your fifties and mm -hmm. you're starting something from scratch. Kudos to you. Congratulations. Most would not do that. So that's, that's incredible. How long did it take you to start mastering the art of speaking? I would say it took from 1994 when I started uh, about 15 years. 15. Yeah, I can pinpoint the day when I realized I was making progress. Which was? Well, I was speaking to a group in 2009, and it was a last-minute situation. The speakers who were supposed to speak that day didn't show up. The organizer was panicking, and I felt so bad for her. I said, yeah, I'll get up and speak. Now, up until that point, every time I spoke, Yuval, I made sure that my hair looked perfect, that my suit was pressed, that my shoes were shined. I was very focused on the external wrapping. I didn't get to do that this day. I just got up there, and I told a story, and I couldn't tell you right now what it even was, but it was I was... I just was vulnerable. I was going through a difficult time in my life and I shared a story, sat down. And my first thought was that sucked. <laughs> They're going to rip me apart on the evaluation. My evaluator, Chris got up and he started giving me some feedback and it was very helpful. And before he walked off the away from the front of the stage, he said, I don't know what you did today, Mike, but that's the best speech I've ever heard you give. Nice. Keep doing that. And I was just, it really threw me. I mean, <laughs> 
I had all these questions in my head. What did I do? I just got up there and I felt like all I was doing was complaining and moaning. And what I realized in retrospect, it was the first time I'd ever truly been willing to be vulnerable in front of an audience. Yeah. To share some of my pain. And from that day forward, well, it was not long after that. And I know if you're listening to this, you can't see, but I was actually uh, dusting my office one day and I had a can of polish, uh, furniture polish, and I'm dusting away because people had told me for years, you're such a polished speaker. Oh, you <laughs> look so good up there. And I, I wore that as a badge of honor, right? Because the hair was good, the suit and all that. Well, I'm polishing my furniture and I look down at this can of, uh, of furniture polish, which you can see, and it said, yeah. oh, nothing sticks to polish. Oh. As Oprah says, tweet of a moment. <laughs> and I thought, nobody is remembering my message because they're too focused on the exterior package. Wow. And from that day forward, and I ever so often somebody will say polish, and when they, when they do, I cringe because I know my message didn't stick. And it happens when you're working on a new, happened last night, I, I'm working on a brand new story and I'm really working I'm, the kinks out of it. And somebody said, but you look so polished. And I said, oh, <laughs> No, <laughs> don't want that. But yeah, that taught me that it's got to be about the message in the audience. And they really don't care how you look. Now, granted, you don't go up in a tank top and cut off shorts when you speak or yeah. tell a story. But don't worry about that. They're there for inspiration to change their lives. Yeah. Well, there are speakers and you know their names. No arms, no legs. And they're up there. And they're more riveting than any polished businessman with a suit can Absolutely. ever right, engage the audience with. So yeah. 15 years that you're not really feeling confident about your speaking, did you want to quit? Did you, like, what, what got you through the 15 years? Part of it was ego. It was that I liked hearing I was polished. And were, you, I, were you trying to prove something to, to your dad? I've never been asked that. That's, that's very possible. I know I was trying to prove something to myself. But it is possible that man I've never met. Uh, that's a really good question. Come to think of it, I've never considered it. That like, I was trying to prove to him, you know, this is what you missed out on, and I have more yeah. worth than you even know. Or maybe secretly thinking he'll be in the audience one day and and hearing you, you know, perfect this craft it might be interesting. Yeah, I don't know about that because this whole idea that I shared with you that. I never really did care whether I met him or not. I still feel that way. That's never yeah. gone away. So I just don't think that's a driving force, but maybe it is that proving you wrong. Yeah. Because I've always loved proving people wrong. And maybe yeah. all that's directed back at him. Well, I think it's an inherent in our in our species, you know, just trying to prove or try to, to get others to love us in some way, right? Even if we don't feel like we want them to, to do so. So you've perfected your, your career 15 years. Now you're an expert. So let me ask you some, some questions on what you've learned, right? So mm -hmm. our ancestors told stories, right, to pass down ideas and information from you know, one generation to the next, right? Correct. It was actually required for our survival back then. They didn't have Google. They didn't have 500 TV channels for easy access to information. So with that said... In your experience, right, knowing that stories convey important information from one to another, why is storytelling so important in the 21st century when we could just gather that much information so quickly, you know, with our phone that's in our pocket? Oh, I love this question, Yuval, because I've inserted this into all my webinars and presentations now. And I ask people, well, with the availability of information on our desktop, our laptop, our phones, TV. Why do we have so many problems? The information's out there. I can go get more information right now than you could ever give me in a five-hour workshop. So yeah. if that was the solution to the problem, why do we still have the problem? The problem is because the information is static and it's, it's somewhat in a vacuum, meaning I need somebody's interpretation of the information to show me how it applies to me. Mm. That's why story is so powerful. And there are many types of stories, but in business, we teach people the three most prevalent kind are the successful client story. 
Mm. This is the story of an individual who went through, was going through some type of challenge, could not solve it by themselves. Tried, tried, and just got more and more frustrated, and it started to affect their emotions. And then the guide comes in. And on business, the guide is actually you as the business person who provides the solution to this individual. The person starts to implement it, takes a little while at first, but then eventually overcomes the problem, succeeds, and is living a new and better life. That's how you provide your perspective and insight into the problem that adds to the information. I love that. Yeah. There's also the founder story or the origin story you can use, but those that's the arc of the story that's gone back since our earliest ancestors. Yeah. We'll touch upon that in a second. So I, I love that. I, I never thought about it, right? Information doesn't give you the context to the experience. And that experience and just a visualization or the understanding of what someone else went through allows us to relate, number one. And that's probably the sticky aspect to our neuron connection, right? Yes. That, that experience. So since storytelling is, is such an important skill to perfect, we know that. And as a speaker, you spent a good amount of time thinking about your subject of expertise and you know perfected your hero's journey and backstory. But for us who are in sales or uh, marketing or just trying to win friends and influence people, as uh, Dale Carnegie wrote, uh, how do we go about capturing the stories that help us build credibility and success in life? I want to answer that, but I do want to address a word you've been using, and I, I don't want to nitpick the host, but be go careful ahead. with it because a lot of people approach me, and that's the word perfection. Yep. None of us will ever tell the perfect story or give the perfect presentation. And I, I meant it, it, this is a caution to everyone. Don't, don't strive for perfection. Mm, I, love I was striving per, for, for perfection when I was polished. Yeah. And I wasn't connecting. So it's all about, uh, I should say, it's not about perfection. It's about connection. Yeah. And our humanness and our vulnerability and our failures is what connects us. And look, we, we've both done it during this conversation. Everyone does it. We've had some stumbles. That's human. Yeah. If you came across as the perfect host and never made a mistake, people would think mm, something about that guy. Just don't trust him. Yeah. Right. Or the guest. Uh, yeah. Same thing with the guest. Uh, far from perfect, my friend. Far from perfect. Yeah. Yes. Now you ask about the, the the source of stories. Well, all of our a lot of people say to me, "Well, I haven't climbed Everest. Haven't won the gold medal. I haven't had these extraordinarily newsworthy accomplishments. Who would want to listen to my story?" Which is precisely why I say that's why people want to listen to your story because. Yeah. 99.99999% of the planet will never win a gold medal, climb Everest, or have these other newsworthy accomplishments. What draws people to us are the relatable experiences. I'm working with a technology company right now, and one of the gentlemen that we're working with is the head of a customer experience department. Mm -hmm. He's working on a story where he talks about getting a call from his mother one day. She's like, I'm so stressed out and I hate this. I need your help because we have this landline and we're not going to give up our landline. And we want you to come over here and help us with all this new technology they're trying to force on us. Now, I'm giving a quick version of his entry, uh, his entree to the story, but there's so much there that's relatable. Yeah, Parents who call us for help, who, who are stressed out by technology, and we go over thinking, I got this solved, right? And his story is very humorous because he couldn't solve it himself, <laughs> but it all ties into a customer experience story he had that he's going to take back to his team to teach them to be better at customer service. That's a relatable day-to-day -day experience. If you're having issues with relationships, money, job, a boss, people need to hear those stories because they're having the same struggles. Yeah, absolutely. So start a story file. Coach all my clients, set an alarm on your phone at the end of the day, take two minutes and just write down what happened today. What was a new experience, a new story that happened that I could use and develop later? Nice. You've got them. The reason you remember stories is because emotionally they hooked you somehow. So I love the story file idea. Let's let's take that a little further. So I think that's a great start to a conversation on regarding not everybody's a great storyteller. Mm -hmm. People are scared, right? They might have 15 years to go to figure it out. But I love this first tip. Start a story file. 
just to put everything in perspective so you can work on it, on the, on the stories. But then what advice would you give someone starting out or someone that's not comfortable speaking for them to be able to start generating some expertise in, in speaking? What would be kind of their first steps? It sounds simplistic, Yuval, but you've got to do it. Mm. Just you do it? You can't read books about it. You can't think about it. Those help. I mean, they help me tremendously to get develop an expertise in storytelling, but I just had to do it. And give yourself permission to go up and fail miserably. Mm. That's the first, the first step. You, you got to find every opportunity to speak. I'm a big fan of, of groups like Toastmasters or any organization that will let you stand up in front of them or in front of a camera and give them a presentation. Do it. Make sure they're low stakes presentations in the beginning. There's not a lot yeah. of money on the line. That's yeah. the first. The second is evaluate yourself. And there's a specific way to do this. How do you think most people evaluate themselves as soon as they're done speaking or sharing a story? Is it based on the audience perception? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't ask that question well. What's the first question they, uh, or first statement they make to themselves or first question they ask when they're done speaking? I don't know. What is it? How could I be so stupid? I forgot that part. And I said hmm. that thing and I stumbled. Oh my God, I'm awful. If you do that to yourself, if you take nothing else from this interview, do not do that to yourself anymore. That is the worst type of feedback because we're all harshest on ourselves. Yes. The tip that we give that has helped a lot of speakers is the first thing you do when you get done speaking, ask yourself, what did I just do well? Mm. What did I do well? It may be you've all something as simple as I didn't pass out. I didn't throw up. I didn't do this. I don't care what it is. Create a list and spend a couple of minutes thinking about what you did well. Then ask the question, what can I do better? Hmm. Not what did I screw up? Why did I suck? <laughs> no, what could I improve? The reason we do it in that order is not just because it's touchy-feely. Number one, it, get, it helps you focus on areas that you're doing well, so you'll continue to do those. You'll take those actions. Because if you don't, if, if you or no one acknowledges it, you'll stop doing it. Secondly, it takes the sting out of the self critique. Yeah. Yes, you're still going to notice, but you're not going to be as harsh to yourself. If you develop that one habit, you're going to feel better about yourself as a speaker already or a storyteller. When do you recommend speaking in a setting where you're getting feedback from an audience? I like to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, what we uh, recommend people do is, especially for storytelling. Now, this is going to be a long way, to, a long way to answer, but I think it'll help. I used to make a mistake as a coach, and that was I would ask people to write out their story and send it to me. And here's why that's a mistake, because I put you into author mode. Mm. We write differently than we speak. Yes. What you want to do is record your story and just get it out. One of the best lessons I learned from my first coaches was a message is a mess with age. <laughs> right. In the beginning, it's going to be messy and who cares? Get it out of your head, get it on a spreadsheet, paper, or preferably a recording. We want to hear that natural speaking delivery, that conversational style. Start to work on it. Maybe if you have a coach or a group or somebody to work with, start to build the structure, but get in front of people as quickly as you possibly can because you are, and I suffer from the curse of knowledge. We know our story so well that we can't conceive that somebody else doesn't know it. So we need to get feedback as soon as possible to say what's confusing, what's clear, what makes sense, what resonates, and what is extraneous, what didn't help me. The only people who can do that are other people. You can't do it yourself. No one can coach themselves well. Yeah, I love that. Your message is your mess with age. That's awesome. I, I have another one that's your mess becomes your message. Yeah. So it's it's that I love to play on words. So thank you for that. I, I think that that's going to sure. help a lot of a lot of uh, the seven hatters. Just just because storytelling is so important in the business world, and we attract a lot of entrepreneurs as listeners. If you do nothing more than just perfect your story, that will completely change the trajectory 
of your career, of the way you raise money, of the way you influence people, especially as an uh, as a founder, you have to convince so many people to buy into your vision. If you know how to tell the story well, you just have that much more of a chance to get others enrolled on your path and your journey. So I watched a video where you had a problem with the term hero, mm -hmm. you know, in the hero's journey. So for those of you who don't know what the hero's journey is, can you, first of all, Michael, give us kind of the seven hatters some insight uh, into the importance of that type of story, what it is, and explain to us who is the real hero? Because if you had the problem with the term hero, sure. is there a hero? Who is the hero? What's your take on that? Yeah, Joseph Campbell was, I'm going to use the term philosopher. He was an academician in the 20th century, and he studied the history of storytelling narrative through human history. And he mm -hmm. came up with this term or this concept called the hero's journey. I don't have a problem with the word hero. What I have a problem with is so many people have interchanged the word hero within the arc of characters that it gets confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, we now call it the transformational journey. Oh, nice. But there are two central characters in every story. One is the main character. This is the person who is living his or her everyday life. Mm -hmm. And then one day, there's an inciting incident that pushes this person out of their comfort zone. And they're, they're disturbed enough by this incident that they want to get back to the comfort zone, but they don't know how to do it because this problem is a big challenge. And it could be something very simple in modern life. It could be a notification from the IRS. Yeah. It could be your significant other saying, I'm very unhappy in our marriage. I mean, it could be anything like that that just says, whoa, <laughs> my everyday life has been changed. Now you go on this new path and you're trying to figure out how to solve this problem and you can't. Mm. So along comes this other central character, the guide. And I mentioned this earlier. This is the person who provides wisdom, new insights, some kind of perspective that helps you see life differently, take new action, and eventually you overcome the problem, you succeed. Now, success is not the end part of the story, you've all. If we just yeah. stop there, the listener could say, well, uh, this this central character, this main character, took all this action, succeeded, and then just went back to the way they were. No, they've yeah. changed. What we need to see at the end is the new life. How does yeah. this person see the world differently? How have that they transformed? That's the nutshell version of the hero's journey. The reason, uh, or what I call the transformational journey. I don't like the word hero because a lot of coaches say the central character, the main character, is the hero. Yeah. And others say the guide is the hero. So it gets confusing. So I just said, I'm throwing it out. It's transformational journey, main character, guide. And that keeps it pretty simple. And in business, you are the guide. You're yeah. the one who's providing the wisdom and the solution to the person who's struggling. And you can't be the 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 transformational character and the guide at the same time, right? You You have to have someone come into the story to help you out because... Some might think, well, you know, I figured it out myself, but that's not going to work, right? It's an excellent point, and you're correct. You can't be both if you want to be believed by your audience. Now, you and I, and if you're listening to this, you've heard the speaker who stands up and tells you how he was struggling, going through all these problems. But then yeah. one day I woke up and I had the answer and look at me now. I'm a super success, right? I've got three houses, one on the coast. Here's my two and a half kids and my three and a half dogs and my two ex-wives and my wife, all that. <laughs> and we're thinking, maybe you have that, but I am not buying that story. Yeah. That's a load of crap. And the, the reason we think that is because that's not how it happened. Yeah. Somewhere along the line, that person got help to overcome the problem. Yeah. And if you're, and I know one of the premises of your show, which to me makes it such a powerful show, is you're asking people to be vulnerable. Well, the same thing with a story. One of my friends says, rip open your chest, tear out your beating heart, and show it to the audience. I love that. That's powerful imagery, but that's what they want. We live in an age of authenticity. And sometimes the guide could be God or a higher power. You look Absolutely. at Eckhart Tolle as an example, or Byron Katie who literally were struggling and suffering so badly in their lives. 
And one day that struggle became so devastating that a higher power came in and literally shifted their thought process. And then they became, they changed as, as a human being. And obviously when the hero returns, they must share the boons with with others. And that's what they've been doing. Absolutely. Which is, which is fantastic. No, that is the part of the new life is going back and sharing what you've learned with others. And, and to your point, the the guide could be an inanimate object or a non-human. I've got two little chihuahuas, great dogs. <laughs> And ever so often when they're sunning in their three season room, I don't know how they got, they took ownership of that, but they did. I look at them and I think, I need to do that more. I need to relax more. Yeah. I'm pretty hard driven. It's like, um, they teach me every day, dude, slow it down just for a minute. Yeah. So the guide can be a dog. Or a bird. I, I have bird. uh, birds out, out, out outside. I'm feeding them. It's, they're very expensive, by the way, to feed. Yes. But I'm feeding the birds. And when I look at them, there's a silence. There's a, there's a, Wayne Dyer spoke of the, the silence between the notes. Yes. That makes all the difference from being noise to transforming into beautiful music. And birds, trees, sunsets, dogs, they kind of take you into that space where you're yes, like, wow, do. you know, I kind of have to chill out. Anyway, we're going off on a tangent. No, that, hey, that bird <laughs> seed is an investment in your soul. It is. I love I'm going to tell my wife that. <laughs> see if it works. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. So, hey, look, take credit for it if it works. If not, say this guy I had on my podcast said it. I thought the same thing. The guy's crazy. Exactly. No worries. Uh, all right. So, some previous guests, and I, we actually met because of my previous guests. It's yes. amazing how one aspect of your journey changes trajectory and the people that you meet as a mm -hmm. result. We would have never met if I didn't interview the initial guests that were on my show. Right. And it was a chain effect. It was really interesting. So some previous guests that I've interviewed, Patricia Fripp. Mm -hmm. We love Patricia Fripp. Yes. Janice Litvin, Matt Ward, Jim Cathcart, Michael Haig, right? Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing individuals. But every single one of them, when I spoke with them, because this was when I started my podcast in 2021, it's actually about a little bit more than a year now of, of the podcast, but they all had an opinion on whether COVID was a good thing or a bad event for the speaking industry or community. What's your take on it? And how do you think the industry changed as a result from being live to being digital, at least for a couple of years? Agreed. I'm going to set aside the human cost. I mean, too many people died from COVID and I'm not, you can't compare that loss. But from a business standpoint, I think it was a good occurrence. Every so often, and, and this is my financial background coming in, ever so often we have to have this cleansing where people get stale. They mm. get too comfortable. I saw some highly successful, highly paid speakers leave the business, Yuval, wow. because their attitude to me seemed to be, well, I have to be in front of an audience in order to have an impact. Well, that's egocentric. Ultimately... Do you care if the insight that you got came from a speaker in front of you on camera, on a video on YouTube, in a course, in an audio book, or a book, or a dog? Right? <laughs> you don't care the source as long as it gave you insights. Those folks needed to wash out, frankly. It's not how you get the message. And it, 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 it really isn't how you get the message to them. It is did the message get through? And because there are so many different learning styles, we need to be adaptable to speaking to a camera, speaking to an in-person audience, and a combination of both, what we're now calling hybrid. I think it was a good occurrence because I, I was going to networking events long before 2020. And I was also doing online coaching since 2017. I'd go to networking events in 2018 and 19 and say, oh, you really need to try this virtual meeting uh, like Zoom or something like yeah. that because it's a great time saver and it'll help you quickly determine who's the, a good person to talk with. And you've all almost to a person, they all said the same thing. 
oh, I could never do that. <laughs> I have to be in front of people. Yeah. And I said, you better get used to it. It's coming. It may be 10 years, but it's on its way, not knowing what was about to hit. Exactly. And I was astounded six months into COVID how people were saying, this is awesome. I love this. What a great time saver. Yeah. I felt just like I did when I would tell my kids something when they were little and they thought nothing of it. Somebody else says it. Oh, that person was a genius. Yeah, no. exactly. But again, not being egocentric, they got the message. It doesn't really matter how they got it. Yeah. I mean, and I think just traveling is so difficult from one, especially if you're if you're a successful speaker, you're traveling three quarters of your year, right? I mean, yeah. three, 200, 250 days sometimes. And that takes a huge toll because you're limited to the audience size, unless you're Tony Robbins and you got 3 million people in the stadium. But right. you're talking about limiting your your reach when you're on zoom you can have five speaking gigs in one day and reach tens of thousands of people so i think yeah i agree with you i think patricia fripp absolutely loved it she's like i'm not going out anymore i i got my te te technician and you know below me he comes up he changes my zoom around and i just do my thing he's like she's like i love it all right so <laughs> patricia's awesome i was at one of the final events she did live about three or four years ago and she said at the time i just want to sit home and read trashy romance novels i love that and with her <laughs> accent oh, yes. best accent that Wait, I've i want to read trashy romance novels yes. exactly But, you know, the other part of this that's so important is that people, until they experience this, it was like a revelation. You got a global audience. You literally can speak virtually yeah, any place anyway. on this planet and impact people. Our reach is now, I mean, it's literally global. And how many different people are you meeting? And I just think it's been a huge benefit to the speaking industry. Yeah. Impact. It's all about impact. I think that's Absolutely. where you get uh, the, the greatest joy in life. It's not the awards, it's not the money, it's not the cars or the homes. It's how much impact are you providing others? And, I, and to me, that, that's always been kind of a driving force, uh, growth and impact. So speaking of COVID, I think we got to talk about VAX. Mm -hmm. Not the Pfizer vaccine, but VAX, the acronym. And yes. VAX, the acronym is visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and smell. Yes. So tell us more about VAX and why is it important? The best stories connect with us emotionally and at a sensory level. So when you can include the senses, the visual, the auditory, kinesthetic smell, that brings people into the story so they feel like they're sitting right there with mm. you. So there's a story I tell about, uh, this is where my Indianapolis uh, story is going to circle back. I've been a huge fan of the Indianapolis 500 race for my whole life, and I've been there 45 times, and it was always a dream of mine to sit in an Indy car and drive on that track. Nice. Fat, you know, fat chance of that. I'm a speaker and a coach. Well, my dear Linda, my partner, gave me a gift four years ago of a solo drive in an Indy car at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Wow. So it's, it's May, it's an overcast day, unusually cool for this day, but I'm sitting in this cockpit, tightly strapped in, I mean, to the point where I can barely breathe. And even though it's cool, I am sweating like a pig. I can imagine. Right? I can smell the gas fum uh, fumes from the car, and I'm so laser focused, I can see the track in front of me. And I'm thinking about all the time. I'm just sitting there waiting to go out on the track. And I'm scared to death mm. because of the orientation meeting I just sat through where they told us everything that could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they scared the heck out of me. So by the time I hit that gas to go, I, I'm shaking, I'm sweating. Uh, now, do you feel like you were right there with me in Absolutely. the car? Absolutely. Versus what a lot of speakers do, and we have to work with them on this. I was sitting in the cockpit of this car, and I was scared to death. Yeah. 
I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it. So we need to bring those those factors in. And you don't have to spend three paragraphs, by the way. You can do it one or two sentences. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel? Yeah. And you can do taste also. That And that's the mark of a great speaker, too. I mean, you're, you're spot on. When you enroll all the senses and you're there, it's, it's almost like you're you're on the edge. I was literally on the edge. Like, what's going to happen? How? Tony Robbins is actually really good at that. Yeah. He's he's great at bringing you in to Russell Brunson too. Very good. Mm-hmm. There's just some great speakers out there. I mean, I tip that tip my hat off to them. So, do you know who taught Russell storytelling? It was a Michael Haig. It was Michael. Yeah, Michael's yeah. been a a mentor of mine, and I get to host a monthly call with him on storytelling. So it's been an he's, awesome experience. I mean, he's shown me how to go deep into it. Uh, but yeah, when I told the first grade desk story, the rain was hitting the window. Yeah, for sure. You, I, were you there in the class? I was there in the class. Yeah. Those those parts are not accidental. Now we have to be careful we don't over detail it. Yeah. I always use the analogy of the paint by numbers kit. If we if you did those as a kid, we're giving you the outline of storytellers, and then you the audience can fill it in with the colors and flavors and make it your own story. So you're there in the scene with us. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I truly enjoyed Michael. He's such an amazing human being. He is. And in his, I, the one thing that I'll always remember, he said, Yuval, one thing about storytelling, you have to elicit emotion. That's his thing. You have to elicit emotion. And I was like, yep, that's what it is. So, Yuval, he has driven that so deep into my subconscious <laughs> that it's like, that's what I tell everybody. Where's the emotion? Where's the it's emotion? like, Michael's channeling me. <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's switch topic uh, sure. topics to one that has always intrigued me, and that is the TEDx stage, okay? Yes. TEDx has graced us with some of the most, I think, engaging and intellectually stimulating stories of our time. And I think that it's a platform that can elevate a person to levels I think they probably can't imagine, right? Mm-hmm. Tell us, because you, you're a pro at helping others prepare for TEDx Talks. What is the impact of TEDx to someone's career, let's say? And what advice would you give to those who are inquiring on what it takes to deliver a memorable and potentially, hopefully, viral talk? I'll give you two quick examples. Simon Sinek in 2009 mm. gave a, an event, a speech at TEDx, Puget Sound, which doesn't even exist anymore. It wasn't even high quality video. Look where he is today based on and that. that that was his beginning? That was his rocket launch. Wow. That's amazing. There's another gentleman named Zha Zhang who wrote a book of his experience of 100 days of seeking failure. Rejection, I should say. Uh He has a wonderful TED Talk. His book is his journey of how he was afraid as a child and into young adulthood on taking chances. So one day he got inspired by someone to seek rejection and failure. Wow. Jia Zhang, J-I-A, I think J-H-A-N-G. I've seen him speak. He's getting better and better as a speaker. His book is awesome, and it is inspri- inspiring to, to, te- to get you to go out and take risk. But he created an entire career from that one TEDx talk. Wow. What does it take to create a great TEDx talk that's, that's actually memorable? Well, there are some differences. You need to tell a good story. However, what a, many TEDx stages and, and I should say organizers don't want is just pure inspiration. Hmm. They want proof. They don't want you to be someone who read about this in a book and loved the theory. Uh, Zha Zheng, he went out 100 days in a row and sought rejection, and that created a message and a memorable experience. If you watch TED Talks at all, just go back and watch them and say, why does that one resonate with me so much? Well, it's because the speaker told a story which was most likely full of vax, yeah. and it had proof of concept, if you will. That's what a lot of organizers want to see is how can you prove what you are telling us? So it's a combination. You don't want to bore people with research data and statistics. And that's why the visuals can be so powerful if you've got video, especially. But tell a story that sets up a premise that you can prove. That's what's different from what a lot of speakers do, which is an inspirational story to pump people up and get them out there. I'm not saying TEDx speeches can't be inspirational. They are, but from a different perspective. 
Yeah. And so what about, is it difficult to, to get on a, on a stage? It, do you have to get approved by some committee? You have how, to, how does it work? Yeah, most of them you have to go through a process where you apply to speak. And many of them have auditions. Most have shifted to the virtual audition. But you just want to hit them with your basic idea. The audition is typically 90 to 120 seconds. So you got to get to the point. Here's my idea. Here's how I'm going to support it. Here's the story I'm going to tell. And it's it's hit or miss, Yuval. I've worked with several organizers, and one of them put it best. She said, I'm not always sure what I want, but I know what I don't want. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not really helping me, but no, uh, find out what the theme is. That's an important part of it. Know what that particular TEDx organization's theme is. Go look at videos of past speakers to see what kind of style they may be looking for might even boil down to the kind of language they use. Yeah. But do some research on that and then just apply. It's it's all about persistence. The same advice we give to spe- uh, professional speakers about speak uh, seeking paid speaking gigs is you got to just keep putting them out there and having conversations and eventually you're going to get one. Do you think that if you're a professional speaker, you can be a great TEDx speaker? You can, but a word of caution, TEDx, whether it's fair or not, it's a trend I see. They're very wary of professional speakers Mm. because professional speakers tend to be performance oriented. Mm. Lots of gestures and high energy. What TEDx wants is the everyday person going up and having a conversational talk like you're over the lunch table talking about their idea, sharing their story, proving their premise. Wow. So we're going to circle back to polish for a moment. There is some polish on professional speakers. You got to take that polish off. Yeah. So how do you develop a TEDx talk? Like what's the, what's the journey look like? You say, okay, I'm going to be a TEDx speaker and you, you host your, your audition tape and provide that. And they're like, okay, great. What, what next? What do you suggest that someone do to get from, okay, you're going to speak to being on stage. Well, their whole premise is ideas worth spreading. Yeah. So what is the idea that's worth spreading? And it cannot be a generic, I want people to feel better about themselves. I mean, that's, yeah. it, it has to be crystal clear and it has to be specific. It has to be your take on an old idea. As an example, and I'm not saying this would be a TEDx uh, topic, but we use the term now transformational journey for what is commonly called the hero's journey. Yeah. That's my group's version, transformational journey. Now, what does that mean? We have to get into our approach to it. But your specific idea worth spreading, what is it? You have to be absolutely crystal clear on that. Second, what research do I have to prove this idea? Why Why is this idea, what problem does it address and how does it help people solve that problem? How are we going to prove the problem? How are we going to prove the success? And then what story best supports that? And when you help others, your clients with their TEDx talks, is there a specific stage where they can come to you? Can they come to you where they have they never really vetted out their idea, but they know they have something? Do you kind of do you kind of work with them on that aspect of it or do they, or should they have a pretty good set of ideas on where they're going to uh, go with their talk? What's the, the I work the right with them on time? any stage of the process, the earlier, the better, because sometimes we don't want to have to undo work that we find is not helping. Um, but if you've got a basic idea, let's work on it. I love that. I, I might be calling if you. If you're well into it and you've been accepted, now how do we turn that into the full-fledged speech? And what's important for me, and I don't know that other coaches do this, I want to talk with the organizer. And the reason I do is because a mistake I made early is I would go down a certain path with the speaker, then find out the organizer was looking for something different. <laughs> you talking about having to undo work. That was very frustrating. So I'm I make sure I'm crystal clear with the organizer. This is what you want and what you expect. The organizer you're talking about the TEDx organizer. TEDx organizer, yeah. So they have they're all their, different. Really? So different yeah. cities, different areas have different requirements of what they're looking for. Yes. For their Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. 
Now, there are some general guidelines they follow, but they all have their own personality. And one of the biggest challenges we're seeing, Yuval, is there's a lot of turnover in cities or even colleges on who's running these events. Mm. So they bring a new personality, a new perspective. What worked a year or two ago may not be what they want now. So you can continue trying to get on on Sure. Stage. Yep. Awesome. I encourage people frequently to do it. Michael, you are an inspiration, an awesome, awesome storyteller. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, but I have one more question. Gotcha. I like to close out my interviews with the following. Who did you have to stop being and who did you need to become to manifest your current success? I had to be stop being that perfect kid who proved, and I, I think... <laughs> I have to interrupt my thought with with a, a thought you gave me today that possibly stopped trying to prove to the father who left that I was worthy of not being abandoned. But in general, just I had to stop being that person who was trying to be perfect, to be right all the time, to uh, know better than you that I was right, and just be willing to be vulnerable, to make mistakes and share those and say, hey, this is who I am, warts and all. If you accept me and my message, that's fantastic because it can help you. And if you don't, that's okay too, because we're not, none of us is for everyone. Yeah. You got to resonate with the right frequency. Absolutely. I love that, Michael. Thank you so, so much for being so vulnerable and really entertaining, even though you probably didn't mean to be entertaining. It was a great conversation. So let's tell the seven hatters uh, what you're currently up to, where they can reach you. How do they connect with you if they want to become a better speaker, if they want to get on TEDx? Well, the first, uh, I've got a couple of projects coming up. We're starting a series of weekly six-week story coaching program where we'll meet uh, nice. once a week online. and It'll be group uh, setting. And you're going to develop a story out of it. But more importantly, you're going to develop uh, an understanding of the process. We're going to take it deep into that process. Also, I've got my second book coming out later this year, and the title tentatively is Your Story Sucks. <laughs> I love the that. life out of your audiences and how to stop doing that. I love <laughs> that. That was an idea of, uh, yeah, that we... <laughs> I do too, because it, it gets attention, but there's a double meaning to it. Okay. Of it can course. mean your story's not good, but it also means it is sucking the life out of an audience. And we've got to stop doing that because if we tell our stories right, it can have a major impact. And your first book, you said this was your second. It's called The Book on Storytelling. It was it's a reference book. I give a lot of tips and insights into storytelling, but it also refers to other people who have inspired and helped me over the years, Michael Hagan, and Patricia being two of those folks. It was more of a reference book. This next one's going to be more of a how-to. Wow. Now, I've got I've got a way for people to reach me. It's my virtual business card and you can probably I'm sure put this in a link. Uh, I will the video. I'll put it in the show. show but notes. it's it's called Infone, I N not iPhone, but Infone, <laughs> infone.co slash speaking CPR. If you go to that, it'll give you links to my calendar if you'd like to talk, if you would like to look at the book or courses we're doing, uh, but it'll give you access to me in any way you'd like, some free reports also. Well, congratulations on your books. I know how difficult it is to write a book, which as I joke, I never wrote one because of that, but congratulations <laughs> for your, to your success. I'm so honored to have met you. We're definitely going to keep in touch and perhaps who knows what we're going to do together. Michael, thank you. Thank you for being a guest on The Seven Hats. Oh, my pleasure, Yuval. You're an excellent host. I've been on many podcasts and I just love the conversational style and uh, you made it very easy and it feels like an hour and five minutes went by in about 25 minutes. So. I agree. I agree. I appreciate it, Michael. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michael. Let's end today with a show segment that I refer to as what can we hang our hat on? And here is my takeaway. Today, we delve into the profound impact of embracing vulnerability in our storytelling journeys. I know for sure that authenticity and imperfection, they hold the key to forging genuine connections with our audience. And to illustrate this point, let me share a quick story. Picture a determined speaker strapped tightly into the cockpit 
of an Indy car at the iconic Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The rain taps against the window. The smell of gasoline fills the air, and a mixture of nerves and excitement courses through their veins. In that moment, they are vulnerable, facing their fears head on and embarking on an unforgettable adventure. Just like that speaker in the car, we too must shed the armor of perfection and embrace our vulnerabilities. It is in these moments of genuineness that our stories come alive, resonating deeply with our listeners and leaving a lasting impact. By sharing our struggles, our setbacks, and the lessons that we've learned along the way, we create an emotional connection that surpasses the boundaries of words. So, Seven Hatters, as you navigate your own storytelling journey, remember that perfection is not the goal. Embrace your imperfections, celebrate your failures, and be willing to expose your vulnerabilities. And in doing so, you'll discover a newfound power to captivate, inspire, and truly touch the hearts of those who hear your stories. I want to thank Michael once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from his wisdom. And until next time, if you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so that we can attract even more high quality people into our 7 Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selick and I tip my hat to you.